My name is Nick, and I have, according to the Harvard Business Review and Forbes magazine, the sexiest job in the world. <laughs> I am a data scientist. <laughs> what does a data scientist do? Well, it's my job to collect and curate the digital breadcrumbs that we leave behind as we navigate the internet forest. I boil the digital ocean, looking for statistical significances, trends, and patterns and use this data to help provide people with better services. We live in an ever-increasingly digital world. More and more of our lives are being lived online. Our email, our social networks, our schools, our banks, our movies, even our shopping lists. It's almost impossible to imagine a life today without some kind of internet connection. In fact, I'm sure some of you are already suffering digital withdrawal symptoms from not being able to check your smartphones while listening to me here. In 1965, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, the chip manufacturer, postulated that the number of transistors you could squash onto a computer chip would double every 12 to 18 months. This law, named after him as Moore's law, has stood the test of time. And correspondingly, the processing power of computers has similarly doubled every 12 to 18 months since. It's this reason that we are now all able to carry around in our pockets more processing power than was used by NASA to send men to the moon. All these faster and faster computers are capturing data at a faster and faster rate. And this, compounded by the fact that we live our lives online, means a huge amount of data is going on the internet. This year, for the first time ever, it's expected that yearly internet traffic will exceed one zettabyte. That's a thousand quintillion bytes. It's an incomprehensibly meaningless set of words. <laughs> what does it represent? Well, let me try and show you. I have in my pocket a single grain of sand. Let's say this grain of sand represents one byte of information, which is a value between 0 and 255, enough to store your age and gender. A teaspoon can hold about 4,000 grains of sand, or about 4 kilobytes. This is the same amount of memory that was in my first computer, a TRS-80. Anyone here have an iPad? This is the memory capacity of an entry-level iPad. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is my contribution to the internet, I see. If I was to bring a giant forklift truck on stage, put a couple of hundred pounds of sand here, I asked, they wouldn't let me. <laughs> That's still just a couple of hundred gigabytes, billions of times smaller than a zettabyte. To get to a zettabyte, we need every grain of sand on every beach on the entire planet. Imagine all that sand blowing around in the sky in a giant sandstorm. This, this is the internet. Don't get me wrong, it's not a negative thing. In that pile of sand here, there are photos and videos of my kids, and I can access them from anywhere in the world. There's my work, my movies, and yeah, my shopping lists. To pull data from the internet sandstorm, we require two things, identity and authentication. Identity, who are you? Authentication, prove it. <laughs> Traditionally, we've used passwords to prove our identity, and I'm here to warn you that most of you have probably been very short-sighted in your selection of passwords. <laughs> so, what is a password? Well, a password is a supposedly secret collection of symbols that you replay to prove that you are the legitimate owner of that identity. But because humans are involved in selecting passwords, there are two very common problems. These are password reuse and password predictability. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass anybody to hear today, but I'm sure I did, if I asked for the house lights to be raised just a little bit and people to honestly put up their hand, if they reuse their favorite password on more than one account, I think everybody's hands will I said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> Reusing passwords is a really bad idea. Why? Well, you're only as strong as the weakest link, or in this case, the weakest website. Whilst most websites do an exceptional job of looking after your credentials, it only takes one poorly configured website to be breached by hackers, and then the credentials can be exposed, and because you reuse that password on more than one account, they can access all those other accounts. Don't do it. The second common password problem is predictability. People are staggeringly unimaginative when it comes to fitting their passwords. 
As part of my research, I've had access to tens of millions of passwords breached by hackers, real passwords used by real people. It may surprise you to learn, frighten you, that using just 100 words, I was able to get access to 9.2% of the accounts. It's worth repeating, almost 10% of all accounts can be accessed <laughs> using a dictionary of 100 words or less. Want another example? Most of us carry uh, smartphones or ATM cards. These are typically protected by four-digit pins. Now, mathematically, there are 10,000 possible combinations of the way the digits 0 through 9 can be raised into a, into a 10-digit pin, into a, into, excuse me, into a four-digit pin. And if they were selected totally at random, we'd expect a fairly uniform distribution across this space. But that's not what happens. Here on screen, you can see the top 20 pins in use, again, from real data. <laughs> Using just the numbers on this screen, I could access over a quarter of all the accounts. To get to a third of all accounts requires just 61 numbers, and to get to half of them requires 526 distinct codes. If we plot all those passwords into a, something called a heat map, which is just a fancy word for describing a pretty picture, in which the brighter colored dots show the more popular passwords and the, less, uh, the darker dots are less popular passwords, in this particular heat map, I've used the first two digits, the pin number, on the x-axis, and the second two digits on the y-axis. We get something like this. You see these, uh, these patterns? They shouldn't be there. The structure in this picture shows that independently, people are selecting the same passwords. The bright line down the leading diagonal from corner to corner, this is people using the say, uh, repeated pairs of digits for their pass number, like 1212, 3434, 7878. In fact, every 11th dot is extra bright. These are people using all four digits the same, 1111, 2222, 3333. Let's look at a couple of other features. This uh, bright line here. This is all the people using the password 19 something something, their year of birth, for instance, <laughs> 1967, the year I was born. Finally, one other section, this uh, bright area down here. These are all the people who are using month, month, day, day as their password, like 1225. And if you look carefully, you can even make out the months have 31 days and 30 days. And poor old February there with 28 and sometimes 29 days. Because of the pace that things move online and because more of our lives are living online, if things go bad, they can go bad very, very quickly. Just ask Matt Honan, one of the editors of Wide Magazine. His digital life was virtually obliterated in a matter of hours when hackers chose to target him. Okay, now I've frightened you all. How can technology help? Well, many websites today can be now configured to support something called dual factor authentication. This means to access this site, you don't just need a password, you need a password and something else. Password and a smart card. Password and a dongle. Password and some time sensitive piece of information. Both puzzle pieces are necessary in order to be able to get access to the site. So if you lose either one of them, your account can't be compromised. It's something you know and something you have. An example of this in use, here's a fictitious website, and uh, Lucy wants to log into the website. In addition to knowing her password, she also has to have possession of her cell phone. The cell phone is sent a code. That code is valid only for a short period of time, and she needs to type it in in order to be able to get access to that site. And even somebody looking over her shoulder isn't going to get any value from this, because the next time she logs on, that code number will change. So in summary, to help keep you safer online, please don't be predictable, don't use your, reuse your passwords, and where available, please use dual factor authentication. Now, I was going to end here, and this was to be my final slide, but being a data scientist, I did some research, and I found out that presentations that end with a little bit of humor are more likely to be remembered. <laughs> So here's my attempt at a little bit of humor. <laughs> Somebody once asked me, they said, hey, Nick, you've analyzed tens of millions of passwords. What's the most creative password you've come across that uses eight or more characters? I'm just going to leave this here. Thank you very much for listening.